you all know I'm a sinful creature, correct? Amen. Some of you are laughing like you, you were thinking that when I got up here. I don't know. I am, I'm fallen. And I will be perfectly honest with you. If I had my choice, I would preach to you the subjects I like the most. I would preach on evangelism. Because I believe that that is one of the most important things that we should be doing. I like witnessing. I would preach on apologetics. I would give you a sermon series on uh, um, why uh, a loving God could send somebody to hell. Uh, how to defend the faith. Those are the subjects that I like. I like to preach on helping people in need. I like to preach on um, being active in the community. You know my heart. You know the things that I would love to preach on all the time. The problem with that is you would only get certain things in the scripture. So by preaching straight through, it's kind of keeping me on task to make sure. See, the Bible covers everything. It really does. So when you study the scriptures and, and, and you stay on task, you know that you're getting a full presentation of the gospel. Um, so that's one of the benefits. This was just a subject that I just don't like to, to preach on over and over again. Uh, we're talking about sexual immorality. How many of you know that on your smartphones you have a compass? Did you know that? No. Mm -hmm. Why we would need a compass in this day and age, I don't know, because now we have Google Maps. We don't need to know which way is north. We just plug in where we are. But on your phone, and I'm looking for mine if you have a smartphone, it would be under what app? Who's, and or your smart, where is it? It should be under Utilities? Utilities over here. Okay. I know that that is a window. <laughs> but beyond that, I know that that is north. Huh? Or magnetic Or, I don't know if it's magnetic or this. It's zero degrees north, right there, point that way. Based on my compass, and I hopefully that these smartphones have the accuracy. I know that that is true north. Some of you, how many of you are challenged when it comes to directions in life? Okay. How many of you would not have guessed that that was north? And which way, okay, uh, okay, I'm seeing if you, Robin and Tamara, which way did you think was north up until the time that I told you which way was north? You thought that way was north, okay? And Tamara, which way did you think that was north? No idea. You would have just north of that. It's straight up. Yes. That's what it looks like on the, on, the, on the actual map. That north is straight up. Uh, and you ladies, even though I have the compass right there, I know who you are, and I know that you're much more charismatic than I am. I would imagine that if you ladies were to come up here and pretended to know which way was north, and you would have come up in unity and said, we both agreed that that's north, and I would have said, no, I have a compass, this way is north, some people would believe you. And some people would believe me. How many of you would have put more weight into what these ladies said than what I said? Raise your hand. Okay, we actually have some people that would have done that. Okay. How many of you are sexist and you say, guys always know? <laughs> you know what I love about our new day and age? I don't have to stop and ask for corrections. Not like I ever did before, but now I don't get lost. Um, you know how many times we drive by the same gas station? Why don't you stop and ask for directions? It's like, because I'm smart. But now it's Google. We can just have yeah, a map. The problem when it comes to sexual immorality in our culture today is that there seems to be very, very, very few people who seem to know what the, what the truth is, what's true north. And there's so many more people in our culture that have bought into the lies based on people who don't have any clue whatsoever which direction is north than this way is north. Now, I don't have a problem preaching against society and culture or anything like that. It just gets numbing sometimes that I know, and I think Randy's going to speak on that, is sometimes I will preach on this and people will listen and it goes out one ear and out the other because the culture is more of an influence. And sometimes as a pastor, that's just, I don't know, it's kind of like, I don't know, I invest a lot of time and sometimes people just don't believe what I said. 
Okay? They're, they have convinced that way is the right direction and that way is not the right direction. And truly what Jesus said, that the road to, um, uh, you know, that leads to, uh, um, to, you know, to him is so narrow, but the path that leads to destruction is what? Is wide. So sometimes this is kind of a depressing subject to preach on when you know that you, you are, as time goes by, you're a lone voice. And when you do speak out, even in public, those people you know who agree with you keep their mouth shut. You know, behind you, the, the choir is not saying Amen. Because they're scared to death what they think. So it's kind, of, it's, it's kind of defeating there, but I will stay on this. I am going to talk about sexual immorality today. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about sexual revolution. What is the sexual revolution? Somebody can tell me in, in their mind, in their thoughts, I know there's some smart people out there. What is the sexual revolution? What is it? John, you have your hand up. Uh, because of improvements in uh, technology, Reproduction and sex are kind of delinked, and so uh, traditional behaviors have become unrestrained because you may be able to avoid consequences of behavior. So. Somebody tell me what John just said, <laughs> so the rest of us can understand it. Or it could be that if he sat down with a man and his rules. That's it. If he sat down, that's what I was actually looking for. If he sat down. No, I, 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 sex has become more than just for reproduction. Is that what you're saying? Because we now have the ability. So before, back in the 50s, it wasn't for fun? <laughs> so I'm going to talk to some of our older people here. <laughs> I'll ask him. <laughs> no, but there, there's, there's more of... Because uh, next, when the next time I preach, now we're gone next week, there'll be no uh, Sunday school unless you want to meet over here. A lot of us are gone. We're going to be at the, the Baptist Children Home, and uh, even the Children Church will meet over here. So just... Just that, that announcement. The week after that, I'll come back, and I thought one of the conclusions that I have on good sex, healthy sex, was that it was fun still, too. Okay. But I don't understand what you said, that, that we removed some of the restrictions and now everything. I think, what's the title? Look in your bulletin. What did I name the title of the sermon? Because that's kind of the outline. Legally free Uncontrolled animals. Legally free, uncontrolled animals. I think that's what John just said. What, that is what John just said, only I simplified it. So John is our resident genius, and I'm the simpleton. I, I'll live with that. But legally free, uncontrolled animals. I think that defines this, the... Um, the sexual revolution. And we're going to look at each one of those as points. Legal, free, animalistic, uh, or uncontrolled animals. Uh, to talk about that. But here is a premise that I have. You, you don't have to write this down. Um, but I think it is, it is true. I think it's genius. But again, I'm a simpleton. Um, what is revolution? Re a revolution is something new, right? It is revolutionary, it is new, we're fighting for what change. The sexual revolution is nothing new. It's always been this way. Legal, free, uncontrolled, <clears throat> animalistic. And what you will find as we read this text is the arguments that we have today are seen in this text. Okay? Legally free, uncontrolled animals. 1 Corinthians 6. <clears throat> okay, I want you to quickly, I'm going to give you a little tip on reading the Bible. We're going to kind of just, we're going to go piece by piece through this, okay? Verse 12a, I'm going to break it down. Everything is permissible for me. You see that? Do you see that there's something around that phrase? What are they? Quotations. Quotations, okay? This quotations is there to help you understand something. This is not what Paul is saying. This is the argument back then. Everything is permissible for me. I am legally okay to 
do whatever I want. Or as we hear it today, what happens between two, three, four consenting adults is none of your business. Have you heard that? And if it is not legal in, by today's standard, Mark my words, there are people who are trying to make certain behaviors legal as we go. And even if it is not legal, there's another word that I would like to add, is many of the sexual behaviors that we would deem immoral, we're going to get to what that is, are considered uh, acceptable in today's society and our culture. I am actually, and I don't want to go into specifics, we have a few kids here, and I, I, it, just, it really is just getting quite boring. And I don't even want to preach for shock value so that you hear something that just isn't normally said in church just to, just to shock you. Um, I, I, we'll just pick one thing here off the top of my head. Rain, you uh, sent me an article one time about the, uh, was that you sent me an article that, that there are now um, counselors out there and, and people writing books? that are telling individuals that the best way to save your boring, pathetic, cold marriage is by having an affair? There are people who believe that. No, no I, I, I'm telling you that there are people who say the best way to save your marriage is to have an open affair. Because the excitement of, of being with somebody you don't know, the excitement of... of of uh, um, uh, taking it outside that marriage, that first kiss, that first embrace, makes your marriage so much more exciting. That is a not accepted behavior in this room, but overseas is becoming very popular, and even over here, more and more people are embracing it. It's acceptable. Legal. Let's talk just first thing. We, we all know what, what the homosexual marriage that is something that people are pushing to legalize in our culture. Before, back in the 1970s, you could open up a psychology book, and it would tell you that they, that from their terminology, from the way they saw it, it was deviant behavior. But now, to say that the behavior is wrong is in fact deviant. You even suggest for one second that homosexuality is a sinful behavior. Well, you are hateful. Because it's accepted. And one day it'll be legal. Polygamy. Polygamy five years ago. What are you talking about? That's crazy. Uh, why would you marry multiple... Uh, um, uh, or lady, or, or who would do that? But yet, T, what is it? The Learning Channel comes up with the series. Uh, HBO has a TV show. And as people are seeing it normalized, there's some people saying... Well, what's the big deal? I mean, it's consenting adults. Who are you to tell them what is wrong? And some of you think that way today. What happens in the bedroom is none of your business. Paul says, Paul uses that. That was the argument there. It's legal. Everything is permissible for me. But look at Paul's response. But not everything is what? Beneficial. G.K. Chesterton said, never tear down a wall or a fence unless you know why it was put up in the first place. There could be a nasty dog behind that fence. Never tear down something unless you know why it was up there in the first place. Um, I think this is certainly true with uh, the legality or the acceptable of the sex. And something else I, I really want to um, hit before I, I, I go on into some of the struggles that I see in our culture today is this. Do you understand, and please, even if you don't, I'm about to tell you, there is a difference between something being legal and acceptable and being something that is moral. <coughs> Do you understand that? It is legal and it is acceptable to kill your child as long as it hasn't been born yet. That doesn't make it moral. It is legal and it is acceptable to sleep with as many women as you want. That doesn't make it moral. It is legal, it is acceptable, acceptable to sleep with as many men as you want. It doesn't make it moral. It is legal and acceptable to sleep with other people, to have sexual intercourse and not be married. 
that doesn't make it moral. The society doesn't ter determine if it is moral. You don't decide if it is moral. There's no such thing as relativism. God decides. He's, he made us. He made us. How many of you have ever read a Drano? You ever, who, who uses Drano as a plumber? I use Rick. But I, <laughs> not, Rick is my guy. I tell you what, you know what? If, if you ever fire me, and I hope after today's sermon, that's not today because there's a business meeting, but if you ever fire me and, and you find another pastor, put this in, in the, uh, the, the pastor's, um, what is it, packet. Okay, we're going to pay you this. You can you live in this house right here, and we got Rick. He'll fix stuff for you because he has been an asset. To me. He may not feel that way. He may talk badly about me, but man, he's been a blessing. So anyway, I just But on Drano, if you ever got a problem with the plumbing, you put the Drano in there, and it magically removes the hair, right? On the back of the Drano, it says this, don't drink it. <laughs> hey, people like me need that. Because <laughs> I, I, you know, you're pouring the Drano, and you're like, that smells pretty good. I wonder what it tastes like. Read the instructions. The people who made this said, don't drink it. Well, they know. <laughs> right? I guess they tested it out on the dog first. Oh, no. <laughs> All dogs go to heaven. It says that in that cartoon. <laughs> Can you eat dog meat if the dog didn't die from drink? These are questions we all think of. Not even before we slip. Why do you think God wrote the things that he wrote in here? Why do you think God had the, the parameters? Why do you think he put the fence around? Why did God say, don't go past this line, don't do this, don't do this? In Hebrews uh, 13, 4, it says, keep the marriage bed pure, you know, flee from all sorts of types of sexual morality. Why do you think he set those up there? Because he's just being mean? Or because he's the manufacturer and he knows that certain things work and certain things don't work? Let's look at our country. Things are legal. How's that working out for you? I'll, I want to ask these questions. I'm going to take that these, these are things that have touched lives <coughs> here. I have a counselor telling another young, uh, an individual that says, you know what? And this counselor has a certain lifestyle. And he has a certain lifestyle. He says, you know what? As I look at your life, look at your life, I think that you have the same lifestyle that I do. You need to pursue that. And this person pursued that. And I would say it's fair that his life has gone crap here recently. How's that working out for you? How about this? We take, we, there are certain people in our society that are shorter than us that we don't trust behind a car. Okay? We don't trust them with guns. We don't trust them with voting. Some of the adults we should not trust with voting, but we still let them do it. We don't trust them with a beer. They can't buy medicine. But hey, throw a condom at them. They'll be all right. They'll figure that out. And if that doesn't work, hey, morning after pill. How's that working out for you in our society? Number one indicator of poverty. Childhood born out of wedlock. And the cycle keeps going. How are the relationships in America today? Strong? Tell you what, pornography is a billion dollar industry. Billions and billions a year go to that. Instead of going to, to, to the church. You know, some, we struggle to pay the bills. Um, we struggle to pay the national debt. Well, we struggle to pay medicine. How's that working out? You're investing all those billions of dollars in flesh. How about this, ladies? How do you feel about your body image? <laughs> You're competing against magazines that Photoshop women into something that doesn't exist. And last I checked, ladies, you get older, don't you? I don't care how good a shape you are today, tomorrow, it doesn't last. How do you feel about your, how's that working out for you? How do you feel about yourself? 
See, things are legal, but it doesn't mean it's beneficial. That's what Paul's saying. But the argument continues. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible. He's saying the same thing again. No, he's kind of he's kind of putting it out this. Everything you, you, you're allowed to do everything. You you're, you're free to do just whatever you want. There is no restriction. You are free. It was the uh, Jacques, it was Sartre. It was a philosopher. He was an atheist, and he said one of the reasons why he rejects God is by removing God. You take down the parameter, and I can do whatever I want. I can live with this woman who I really like, and you know we can be partners, life partners. But that doesn't mean that I can't sleep with everything else out there. I'm free to do whatever I want. And that is the American's argument. We sleep with who we want, when we want, how we want, and everything is legitimate. There's a few lines out there that you can't do. I was watching Friends a number of you, you remember when Friends was all right there? And I was kind of amazed even back, and this was probably seven and eight years ago. I remember that there was a time when pornography was, I mean, it was something that, that guys did, but it was done secretly. You know, they hid things. I just remember watching an episode, and they all got together, and they were all watching it on television together and having a lot of fun with it. It was very exciting. <laughs> I can't watch sitcoms nowadays anymore without the major premise behind it being something sexual. I love The Big Bang Theory. I think it's a funny show. I think that there's a lot of hilarious stuff. But I can't watch one episode to where it's not been sexualized in some way. We're free to do whatever we want. We're free. Some of you are free right now. Running through a wheat field. Wind blowing in your hair. Free. I can sleep with you all. Do whatever I want. And yet I have guys come up to me, not even part of this church, want to have secret meetings because they're so addicted to porno. It's not even funny. They don't want to take a razor and slit their wrists. Because they know they shouldn't be doing it, even though they're allowed to do it. They cry at night. They're so scared their wife's going to find out. They spent all that money on it. That one guy in Champagne, it's actually a friend of a friend who's an engineer. I mean, the guy's successful at the University of Illinois. And He's addicted to sex. Got a wonderful wife, several kids. Look, let me rephrase it. Had a wonderful wife. Had kids that looked up to him. But he can't stop. He's addicted. Great word. So many in America have sexual addiction. No, that's nothing new. You've just chosen your master. Look at what Paul said. Look at what he says. Everything is permissible, but I will not be what? Mastered by anything. You're not free, you're a slave. <clears throat> Jesus promises freedom. The sinful nature enslaves you. You're not free. There's this lie out there, and I think that, and, and unfortunately, those individuals who, and we'll talk, we'll talk about this here in a second, who are born this way, that there are people out there that, that, that are born that way to where, oh, they're, they're animals and they, they need to mate with multiple women, or they're born that way and they have homosexual tendencies or whatever. There's this, there's this belief out there that if it's just legalized or if it's just accepted, then I can perform that behavior and, I, and, and everything will be okay. You know what? Because it's morally wrong and God defines what is morally wrong. He's the one who put the law upon your heart. It doesn't matter what culture says. It doesn't matter if it's illegal. It doesn't matter if it's accepted. It doesn't matter that you're free to do it. You will always be a, a slave to your impulses and it will always convict you. And the moment it stops convicting you and your heart is hardened, you're lost. Dead. 
Jesus gives us freedom. Jesus gives us freedom. <clears throat> he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. He said, the truth will... Where's my compass? The truth. It'll tell you the direction to go. But you'll be free. He's not, though he is a master, not a cruel master. In fact, as we'll see in a couple of weeks, sex uh, in a marriage is, is, is much more enjoyable. Oh, we'll get to that in a second. Objection three. Animalistic. Animals have needs. Here's how they argued it back then. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. I am man! Man must eat. So eat. Man must pee. Pee. Man must release other things. Find woman. That's right, quick went into a urinal. Um, I can't help it, I'm born this way. I have needs. How many of you ladies have justified your husband or your boyfriend's abuse? Because he's just a man. Find the line, Sam. Materialistic. A homosexual argument. I mean, you can believe this right now. They're born that way. You know what? You're more likely. You, you can convince. What about what about other men? Just just those of you who think that way. Just let me ask you this question. Um, I let me tell you how I was born. Uh, I find women attractive. Because I find multiple women attractive, is it okay to go outside the parameters of the marriage because I'm born that way? No, there's still rules and regulations, right? Uh, I am born in such a way that I want to really kill people. I, mean, I really want to kill people. Sarah's over there going, amen. I really want to kill people sometimes. I'm driving down the street and you're going 30 and it clearly says 35. You really need to die. But I'm a pastor so I send you to Jesus. It's okay. I'm born that way. Is it okay to do it? No, we have rules, restrictions. Being an animal is not an argument. But here's what I want to tell you today. I want to, I want to, I want to leave this for a second. I want to leave the material universe. I want to leave this idea that there is no God and there is only material and then you have needs. You're nothing more than an animal. Let's just go ahead and say it's a given that you're an animal, that you're, that you're some sort of creature. You are created, you're a creature. You know what else you are? You're spiritual. You are material and you are spiritual. Paul argues this. He says, they said, they said this, they said, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. But God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality. Let me read some text to you and I want to talk about the spiritual for a second. 1 Corinthians 6, 16 through 17. Jump down, we'll, we'll read backwards here in a second. He says, Do you not know this, that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. There's some powerful stuff right there. And, and in that, we see one of the things that sex actually does uh, between a man and a female, between a husband and a wife, right there. It unites them. It makes them one. Now, I don't know if this is a good thing for my wife. I don't even know if it's a bad thing for my wife. But I'm going to tell you that she knows me more than anybody in this room or in this world. She knows me better than my own mother and my own father. Because we're one. We not only physically became one, but because of that, there, part of that, there is a process where spiritual beings do. We've become one spiritually. Over time, I will probably look like her and she will look like me. One of us is cursed in that and one of us is not. We'll think alike. We'll, we'll finish each other's sentences. 
We already did. I know her. She knows me. We're one. In the beginning, it says this. It says, well, God says, you two, you will, you, will, you will leave your parents and you will unite with your spouse. You will reunite with them and you will come together and you will become one. It is uniqueness. There will come a time, and most likely I will die before her, but it will tear her apart. If she dies before me, I will probably quickly go after her. Why? Because we're one. Go ahead, ladies. Go ahead, men. Share that with other people over and over and over and over again. And rob yourself of that. That is a spiritual connection. God gave us that. Rob yourself. You're going to unite yourself with a prostitute? Well, I'm never going to have a prostitute. Oh, oh, hold on a second. Will you exchange? I don't know. Well, let me talk to ladies. Will you prostitute? Will you prostitute yourself in this way? For affection, you will exchange for sex. For attention, you'll exchange sex. Prostitution happens when something is exchanged. And it doesn't have to be money. But he goes on, 1 Corinthians 6, 13 through 15. I read this out loud. And I think this is great right here. He's talking about sex. He's talking about um, in relationships right here. But, but this is very theological. It's just packed with scripture. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. But God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual morality, but for the <coughs> Lord. And the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that the bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with the prostitute? And then he says, never. Uh, I was watching a show the other day, and it, and it was in a secular show, and uh, one, of the, one of the young men on there admitted that he had a, a sexual relationship with the woman who happened to be the daughter of... The farmer who they were kind of who the farmer had reached out to them, and the argument was, don't let the farmer know, don't let dad know, don't let this guy know because he knows it. Shotgun, boom! Either going to shoot you or you're going to get married. So let's just keep this a secret. You're a Christian. Each one of you is a child of God. You know, Jesus loves you so much that he would die for you. Men, the women you date, that's a daughter of the God Most High. And he loves her. And you think you're going to get away with using her for your own selfish pleasures? See, in marriage, it's a ministry. It's cyclical. But outside of marriage, it's selfish. Think God's going to be okay with you using women, men, as a urinal to get rid of stuff you need to deposit? Men or women, do you think it's okay? Do you think that, that, that the seduction that you use for these men, just so you can get a little bit of affection, that's, that, again, very selfish? You think God is going to take kindly to you using men that he died for? In that way. And the second part of this, this text, I, 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 I think it's... It's this. God is with you. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Where is God right now? China? Where, where is he at? He's around us. Is God with you on an airplane? Is God with you when you're in Sunday school? Is God with you when you're alone behind the computer? Is God with you when you're naked with somebody else? 
Is he there? Do you like to think of that? Do you have a picture of Jesus in your bedroom? I'm not a big fan of pictures of Jesus, so. Do you have one in there? <laughs> we have a picture of my mom. <laughs> accept or embrace is the idea that Jesus is with us. Would you watch what you watch if Jesus was with you? Would you listen to what you listen if Jesus was there in the room with you? Would you do the things you do with that person if Jesus was in the room with you? Would you do the things that you do with that person if not only you knew that Jesus was there with you, but you also realized that that person you're doing that with is a child of God. That kind of changes the equation. <clears throat> Sexual morality in the church, it's, it's very high in the church. I think, what is it, 40% of, I don't even know if the, what, what the number was. I'm thinking back to the, the, uh, the, uh, the men's thing that John and I went to that one time, the uh, uh, promise keepers. They, they, they get that statistic, like 42% of pastors are, are addicted, remember, that you're, whatever, to pornography. I mean, how would the church change today if you just took that basic understanding of who God is and where He is and just realized He's with you? He's with us. He's with us. Object, objection for... And I'll read the scripture here in a second, and I'm closing here really pretty quick. Uh, it's my body, I can do with what I want with it. Um, I, I never understand how this, how this uh, it applies to abortion. It's my body, and I can do what I want with it. I, I don't know, it's a different argument, different discussion. Um, in, the, in the military, we got. I had to hide this because I was in the Philippines. And I got this tattoo. It costs two bucks. It says Dana or Dan. Not sure. But it, it, it's there. Um, and it's very permanent on, on my chest. Two bucks. Uh, story about how it came to be is, is, is kind of hilarious. And that's just, this isn't the place. There's never a place for that. But anyway, um, I had to hide that thing for like weeks. Because in, in the Marines, especially in the Philippines, you were ordered. He said, they said, don't you get a tattoo? I said, what you talking about? It's my body. Get what I want. No, see, here's what they teach you in the Marine Corps. Uh, it's not your body. It belongs to us. And if we catch you getting a tattoo, you have damaged government property. <laughs> and you would be held liable for what you've done. Your body is not yours. It's, it's not. It's not. First Corinthians six eighteen through twenty. Uh, flee from sexual morality. All other sins a man commits are outside of his body. That he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, from uh, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. He not only made you, which makes you. His, but he also died and paid for you. You are twice his. It is not your body. I wrote down three quick questions, and I'm going to quickly answer them, and I'm going to finish it. When is sex immoral? Somebody can raise your hand and answer that. When is sex immoral? Because sometimes, you know, with different presidents, it's different things. <laughs> when is sex immoral? Anytime it is done with somebody other than your spouse. Well, I don't have a spouse. Well, you don't have sex. Go to 
to uh, Exodus and it talks about uh, an adulterous affairs um, and it talks about um, sleeping with somebody uh, and having an adulterous affair where they're promised to somebody else or they're married to somebody else and, and God says kill them both. It's like well that's kind of extreme. No, 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 no. The price of sin is always death. So don't think about that. But he goes on to explain why you do that. You want to purge the evil from the land because it will destroy society and culture. Very powerful right there. You don't have sex if you're not married. And if you think for a second, and, 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 and I hear this all the time, and I hear this and I just don't understand it, it says, well, I, I, you know what? I don't know if I want to marry this person. Why would you unite with them and become one with them? Why? Why would you spiritually connect with somebody you don't even want to commit to? Why? There's nothing wrong with having sex. There's nothing wrong with getting married. If that's if you were listening that next week, get married. That's what I tell people. I don't care. You know, fine, you're having sex, get married. I don't want to marry. Stop it. That's my counsel everything. Stop it. Keep it in your pants. You can invest the time in finding a sex partner. You can invest the time in finding a spouse. What about uh, pornography and romantic not that? You know that men and women are built different. Mm -hmm. Most of you would raise your hand, oh yeah, pornography is, is sinful, but then the romantic novels, those are okay, right? Ladies, those big romantic novels. You know what they both do? They present a picture that doesn't exist. Men are physical creatures, okay? It presents a picture that doesn't exist that your wife can never compete with like that because it's, it's not real, it's fantasy. And you take away from your spouse and your oneness and your connected by looking at that crap. Ladies, reading those novels, those romantic novels, guess what? Doesn't exist! It's not an excuse, men, you need to be romantic. I'm working on that. Apparently you can't bring flowers to your wife from a grave. Okay, I understand that now. <laughs> Even if they're pretty flowers in a circle. <coughs> romantic is precious. For those television shows that present the perfect relation, you're, you're building an environment that your husband just cannot compete with. How far can I go before I actually cross that line? If you're not married, Jesus said, or even if you're, you are married, the looking can be crossing the line. You understand that? The looking. Now when it comes to your spouse, I don't think that there's, I mean, anything really taboo. And we'll get to that later. Closing. God is not against sex. It didn't surprise him when he looked down on his creation and said, what are you doing? Stop that! <laughs> you kind of, I'm not in biology, but the you know, the parts seem to make sense. They fit. There are reasons he gave us sex. We'll kind of look at that in a couple weeks when I get back. But he has a parameter. And understand that that was put up there for your benefit. Not to restrict you, but for your benefit. Because sex inside of a marriage is very uniting and, and, and comforting, and it, and it does, it, it, it connects the two, it grows the love, it grows the relationship, it ministers to one another. There's so many things that it does. And by all means, marry, have it. Lots of it. Don't keep it in the bed, no, please. No pictures or videotapes. Phone things. So, all right, I know, uncomfortable subject. It was the next passage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, thank you for the gift that you've given us, Father. Uh, thank you for um, that, that, uh, the intimacy that you have between um, uh, husband and wife, Father. Uh, we pray uh, because we, we, we know the desires that we have and, and Satan knows the desires that we have. We know that they are strong. 
and they are powerful, and there are these these urges. But your scripture is clear. It says that you know there's no temptation that we cannot resist as long as we quickly get away from it. Which was the Apostle Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 6 that we just read: flee from sexual immorality. That we don't play with it, that we don't necessarily get around it, but when we recognize that it's in our presence, we run as fast as we can away from it. Because we know we cannot resist the temptation the longer that we stay there, Father. We know that we can flee to you um, in these times of temptation. Run to the Word of God. Run to prayer. You are strong and you give us the shields that we need. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.